found my way to running a day surgery specialist group in Sydney. And I got in there with my analyst hat on. I thought, you know, I'd read the numbers and pull the levers, but there were no numbers. I was just blown away coming from that kind of investment banking world into what seemed like a very successful business mm. and to see how bad the administrative like financial management was, was an absolute revelation. Marcus Wilson is a visionary entrepreneur and healthcare industry expert, widely recognised for his innovative contributions to the medical billing and revenue cycle management sector. With a background in finance and a passion for improving healthcare operations, Marcus co-founded Surgical Partners, a groundbreaking healthcare technology company. As the CEO of Surgical Partners, Marcus has led the company to revolutionise the way medical practices and healthcare facilities manage their financial processes. Under his leadership, Surgical Partners has developed cutting edge solutions that streamline billing, coding, and revenue optimization, allowing healthcare providers to focus on delivering exceptional patient care without the burden of administrative complexities. Marcus's deep understanding of the challenges faced by healthcare professionals in maintaining financial health has driven him to create educational resources, speak at industry events, and collaborate with experts to shape the future of healthcare administration. Welcome to Hacking Health. This podcast is for future-focused health experts, thought leaders, and change makers who are interested in making health accessible for everyone because together we can get to the future faster. What destinations on your travel bucket list are you particularly excited about visiting in the future? Oh, look, I've uh, always wanted to go to Africa. I was lucky uh, with some work travel some time ago to go to Cape Town and Johannesburg, but I've never really been to the heart of Africa. And mm. uh, my parents have recently retired and they've got a bit of a, a bucket list of their own and before their health starts to fail them. And uh, they've been very generous with their time and uh, wanting to see the the family travel with them. So I'm really excited to be going to Kenya and uh, Tanzania in uh, in July next year, and um, to be doing that with you know my kids and my parents and some of the extended family is uh, going to be a real treat. Something I've always wanted to do. Oh, that's amazing! I'm desperate to go there too. I've never been to Africa, so definitely on the bucket list. We had a similar trip with my husband's parents and his brother and his four kids and our kids to Sri Lanka, which is where Dave's dad was born. And wow. just before the before the um, pandemic, so 2019, and they, like Dave's parents, aren't really able to travel now. And so yeah. it is so, yeah, we feel so lucky that we got to do that. And I'm sure that yeah. your kids will love that experience with their grandparents too. Absolutely. That's how I'm looking at it. Just uh, great to get it done before it's too late. Is there a particular hobby or interest that you find helps you recharge and maintain your perspective and outlook? Look, I really like cycling. I'm a bit of a, you know, sort of middle-aged sort of uh, mammal, as they call them. <laughs> um, I really find that besides giving, you know, a significant slab of exercise, either sort of in the mornings before work or on, on the weekends, you can cover a lot of ground in a short time or reasonably short time. And I think the best part that I really like about it is, you know, you can go in groups and and talk to people. And often these are people that aren't from, you know, your industry or aren't even from your background. They're often people you've only met on a few rides. But I really like that ability to kind of just have really sort of general vague conversations with people and I really find it a real sort of almost like a mental health mm. exercise and besides that kind of I guess conversational and and you know getting to know people and getting maybe a few things off your chest to a random person that those kind of benefits there's obviously the real health benefits you know I I find that after doing a significant ride in the morning and you know, just walking up the stairs into work, I can just feel the light burn in in the quads and, uh, you know, really feel satisfied that, you know, I've got out there, I've, you know, 
had some really interesting conversations and also covered a lot of ground and seen a lot of this beautiful city that often don't get the chance to go out and see. So, um, yeah, I find that very rewarding and very helpful in terms of like a state of mind at work. So which city are you in, Marcus? So I'm in Sydney and I ride with some guys out of Lane Cove. I'm based in the eastern suburbs myself, but and I can ride locally around, you know, Bondi and uh, Centennial Park and things like that. That's always nice. But to meet some people on the North Shore, there's uh, sort of a great range of rides you can do up there, sort of, you know, up to Bob and Head on um, the Hawkesbury or Golston Gorge or out to Middlehead around Castle Craig or even the slopes of Mossman, you know, down yes. to Balmoral and Mossman Wharf around, uh, you know, the harbour front, sort of Obelisk Bay or Bull's Head back up to Lane Cove. There's just a number of different directions, all of which have some, you know, spectacular views and, yes. and little sort of coves and national parks. So it's a great place to ride. Yeah, great place to live. Are there any books, movies or quotes that have had a lasting impact on your perspective and outlook? Look, I'm not a big reader of books, but I I really enjoy sort of movies or shows that involve sort of science or, you know, introspection or deep character development. I'm really interested in kind of dramatic events in history. So Mm -hmm. um, I guess those sort of real life stories that are just fascinating, like one that's really interested me lately is is Lincoln, for example, mm-hmm. so the Civil War and, you know, how sort of substantial conflict like that can be resolved in light of a country that sort of needs to repair itself and, you know, get on with things and to have an economy that, you know, comes out of it not completely destroyed and, you know, relationships between, you know, such anim- animosity between states can be repaired and 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 settled for the greater good. So, I mean, those kind of stories and quotes from, yeah, the likes of Lincoln and, uh, you know, Ulysses Grant and, I mean, that stuff is just, I find that just fascinating because it's real and because it was just so enormously dramatic and impactful mm. to, I guess, modern history. They're the kind of uh, movies and stories that I really like. Those with real impact and real characters who just, you know, had such a a powerful impact on, you know, in their time on this earth. I think that's, that's, I find that stuff just, yeah, really powerful and inspirational. Yeah, Lincoln is an amazing story of leadership. And, yeah, I went, I was lucky enough in November last year to go to his summer house in DC and heard a story about how the the cemetery you could hear the bugles play every time there was a every time there was a service for a serviceman who'd fallen and he was there a lot and he could hear multiple times a day this bugle knowing his men were being lost but standing in the face of that to continue knowing he was on the right path and that eventually, you know, the civil war would be won, just kept going. And I just thought, imagine the strength of character that that takes. Very moving and, yeah, such an interesting person. So what's next? What is your personal mantra or philosophy that you live by and how does it guide your decision-making approach in life's challenges, which as an entrepreneur, I know there are many. Look, I, my, my sort of approach is around trying to remove constraints to progress. You know, I think that uh, there's only so much you can do as an individual. You really need to you know, empower the staff and, you know, ensure they are, you know, they feel ownership, not only of the project they're working on, the product they're working on, the solution they're providing, but they feel real ownership in the success of the the venture. And I think if they have that ownership, then really in leadership, it's kind of about ensuring they don't have the constraints in their role to make sure they maximize the value of their contribution to that ownership. So I think 
One philosophy that's had a really big impact on me is, is theory of constraints, TOC thinking. And so if I could end up spending most of my time removing barriers to projects, to, sorry, to progress for my staff to make sure they can, you know, deliver the most and achieve the most in their area of the business, then, you know, I think it would be not only, you know, contribute, contributing to a you know, fantastic performance of the company but mm. it will also just you know make their contribution so much more satisfying mm. so we're all about sort of extreme ownership yeah and everyone really feeling as though what they're doing is significant and it's and it's really contributing and I think consistent with that I think it's really important to be transparent to all levels of the company about you know how things are going wins obviously but you know making clear what the challenges are and and I think the more clear you are on where you're going, why, how it's going on the path to get there, then I think owners within the company can really, within reason and with some respect, kind of hold each other to account a little bit because, you know, everyone's in it for, for ownership and mm. at least partly for ownership. And also uh, I like that they can hold me to account as well because, you know, I've made clear uh where we're going and why and if any of my actions aren't consistent with that then you know they can call they you have the opportunity yeah yeah they can absolutely raise it and then and then it's not so much about me leading and me telling them what to do but yeah holding everyone to account and mm. I think that yeah I don't think that we have perfected that by any means but I think you know the strides we've made in that area over the last you know six 12 months have been pretty transformative for us as a company. So, so far working well. Fantastic. So I guess this might be sort of linked to something you've just said, but how do you approach self-improvement and personal growth? Are there any practices or habits you've adapted or adopted to continuously evolve as a person? Because as a leader, it's obviously something you've alluded to. You want to be called if you're not doing what you say you're going to do. That's part of it, I'm sure. But what else is there? I think it's really important to keep myself healthy, like as a habit. Mm. I think that in entrepreneurial endeavours, particularly when, you know, you've taken on some investment, there's, you know, investors to look after, there's staff to look after, there's customers to look after, there's there's a lot of people sort of clamouring for outcomes and results. And, you know, in the early days in particular, when you're relatively under-resourced, mm -hmm. that can be really damaging on your health. And it's really easy to say, I remember when I was in the, the real depths of those challenges, you know, my wife would drag me along to the gym and the guy who ran the gym, lovely guy, lovely guy, he would say, you know, the one thing that, you know, what's his name at Virgin? Yeah, Richard Branson. Virgin. Yeah, Richard Branson would always say the founders he most respects are those that, are those that get out and exercise. And I remember thinking, well, what a luxury. Like, yeah. um, you know, I wasn't, I was hardly sleeping. I wasn't particularly healthy. Mm. And I guess the one thing that changed, and I did have a bit of a luxury of a more significant team by this point, is that I just prioritised sleep. I prioritised health. I prioritised, you know, thinking about, you know, what I was eating, just making sure that, you know, I'm not always a picture of health and by no means perfect, but... I think that uh, once I started looking after my health, that a lot of things in terms of, you know, what I guess most people would regard as kind of disciplined physical and mental practices kind of fell into line mm. behind that. And, you know, I lost a lot of weight. You know, I mean, being in the healthcare industry, as you know, is quite <laughs> unusual. You know, I remember going to conferences and, you know, having these well-meaning people who normally wouldn't say this kind of thing, but just saying, look, you know, you're really looking unhealthy. Look after yourself, you know? basically. Look after yourself. Yeah, I'm worried about you, you know. And, yeah. you know, it's always good people, good when people do that because at least, you know, they care. But, mm. um, but yeah, there was, uh, there was some real issues there for a long time. And so I think that, you know, that's the best thing that I did for myself. And, um, you know, just in the last couple of months, I've noticed that it hasn't been as great as the year before. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's something that's, you know, it's never automatic. Yeah. You've always got to work that and stay on top of it. But um, yeah, 
that's probably been the the most successful thing for me personally. So what was that pivotal moment where you decided to use your financial expertise and combine it with the healthcare industry for a solution? Yeah, look, I've I've always been in healthcare. My father's a radiologist. My mother's uh, was a nurse. My father was heavily involved in the roll-up of corporate radiology in the late 90s and then the 2000s, so one of the first big radiology corporate roll-ups. So, yeah, he was very exposed to that kind of corporatization of medicine and the entrance of private equity and uh, listed companies in health services in Australia. So my early career was exposed to that. And I did uh, engineering and commerce at uh, university, but I was always interested in medicine, always mm-hmm. interested. I did a, an honours thesis for engineering uh, about uh, flow rates through artificial heart valves and oh, it effects wow. on thrombosis of the blood. Yeah, so it was um, a really exciting. I did that on exchange in the US. You know, it's back in the 90s, it wasn't easy to work on really exciting thesis projects like that in Australia. We just didn't have the the resources, but in the US, that's kind of part of the course, of course. And then so I did a bit of that as part of my, you know, honours part of engineering. And I actually applied for the postgrad medicine. So there's that test that you can do. And I did very well in the test. I was top 10% or whatever. But um, then they have the interview stage where they, you know, interview and, you know, apparently two out of three gets got through. I didn't get through. And Aww. I did it the second year. And uh, same stats, two out of three got through and I got knocked back a second time. And so for whatever reason, I think the universe was talking to me. And I uh, ended up in in investment banking. I was working at Macquarie Bank and uh, working in the healthcare uh, research team. So ended up covering a lot of the listed companies like Ramsey and HealthScope and Sonic. Mm -hmm. So I started putting my, I guess, healthcare interest and I guess uh, finance training to work with, you know, probably Australia's most successful investment bank. So it was a very high paced environment working with very smart people. You know, it was very hard work. It was very well paid. It was during the 90s, sorry, the 2000s, which was a real boom time in the in the investment banking world. And uh, so I got exposure to healthcare from a top down, you know, from an investment macroeconomic standpoint, from a government funding standpoint. And yeah, so I, I stayed exposed to healthcare. And then I wanted to get in the operational side. I wanted to leave banking. I had a great time, but it was enough for me. And wanted to get in the operational side of health, did an MBA. And instead of during the MBA, sort of, you know, I guess getting interested in management, I actually got this kind of entrepreneurial bug from it. I did this uh, course called Realising Entrepreneurial Potential when I was there. And there was 40 teams, you know, that was in a competition with angel investors for funding. And of the 40 teams, my team won. And so I got all excited about this and um, came back to Australia, originally looking at again, operational roles in healthcare, but found my way to running a day surgery specialist group in Sydney. And I got in there with my analyst hat on. I thought, you know, I'd read the numbers and pull the levers, but there were no numbers. I was just blown away coming from that kind of investment banking world into what seemed like a very successful business Mm -hmm. and to see how bad the administrative like financial management was, was an absolute revelation. At the same time that I got exposed to this sort of microeconomics, I'd had the macroeconomics and I got exposed to the the microeconomic reality on the ground. Um, At the same time, there was this big democratization of financial management tools brought about by mainly the Xero, X-E-R-O, you know, the accounting system and its ecosystem of solutions like payroll systems and accounts payable. So there was all this innovation coming into small business. Yes. And I looked at healthcare and I just went, oh, I mean, what a cause, like what an application of this innovation. And that was 10 years ago. And I actually thought back then that things were going to happen quickly. Yes. You know, I thought, geez, got to get into this. You know, this is this is a revolution. And if we don't get ahead of this, you know, but we'll here we behind. are 10 years later and it's, yeah. It's still pretty bad. So anyway, that's a bit of the genesis of of how it came about. And um, yeah, that's how the sort of surgical partners business, it was originally sort of a consulting business. And then we thought, well, you know, if we can build some technology to really, you know, accelerate this adoption, accelerate, you know, innovation in financial management and health, then there didn't seem to be anything on the the shelf. So we, we built it ourselves and and off we went. 
Fantastic. So payroll tax is very topical in healthcare right now. And I know that Surgical Partners has a solution uh, or is trying to be part of the solution for payroll tax. But what's your take on what's going on in this space? Well, I mean, obviously there's a lot going on and it's changing all of the time. Mm. We are not uh, accountants or lawyers. Mm. And so we're in an interesting position where obviously we're very close to everything that's happening. We're working with some of the most significant institutions and, uh, you know, companies in this space who are very well advised and very well informed. And, you know, our clients are, you know, the biggest operators in the country. Uh, you know, CBA is a minority shareholder in, in our company. We work with very closely. They've got a significant investment in general in the healthcare space. They're, they're really innovative. And, you know, so we're very close to what's happening, yes. but it's clearly changing a lot. I think that, you know, the one, I guess the way I like to think about it is there's a silver lining here. And the silver lining is, that there is enormous amount of investment that's coming into, you know, technology and advice and solutions for financial management problems generally. And wherever this mess kind of lands, wherever it sort of plays out, the one thing the entire industry is going to benefit from is substantially more investment. And mm. um, I can give a few examples maybe later in this talk, but, you know, for us, it's been transformational, not necessarily because we're providing any specific solutions. I mean, we, you know, whatever people's advice is, if they're advised to, you know, move to separate accounts for doctors or, um, you know, into trust models or, you know, a particular technology that we're working on with CBA, for example, mm -hmm. whatever their advice is, yes, we've got an automation solution that's going to help. So, that's really that's a real privilege to be able to help people, whatever their advice is. But the real silver lining is that there is such innovation and um, the kind of things that we've always wanted to do have been brought forward. And the kind of things I'm talking about are like, you know, really taking the friction out of the association between a doctor mm. and a practice. Like the red tape you have to yes. go through when a doctor starts at a practice is just it's obscene mm. and there's no good reason why it is that way mm. other than it's a niche industry which just hasn't had the investment that it needs but that it is getting that investment and so I think it's uh you know watch this space there's some really really exciting things that's coming to the industry in the next year or two. What strategies have you found effective in overcoming resistance to change within the healthcare industry especially when dealing with established practices? You can't avoid just the the challenge of time. You know, I remember throwing a shingle out at, you know, a practice manager's conference nine years ago, mm -hmm. speaking about accounting integration. And these very well-meaning, very dedicated practice managers would look at me like I was an alien, like, uh, what the hell are you talking about? Mm. You know, um, and often in those positions, there's some fear of change. You know, it's just the unknown. It's just never really something they've had exposure to or had to think about or even thought there was a solution to. And so, and, you know, it's an industry that has, for very good reason, been resistant to change. You know, they're looking after very sensitive information. Mm. They're um, obviously looking after the population. And it's a, you know, obviously it's a very you know, uh, you know, science and mm. evidence driven um, yes. industry by definition. So, you know, to be able to, you know, prove that you are going to make their life markedly better for a concept they've never heard of, mm. a brand they've never heard of is always just going to be difficult. So those first five years were extremely challenging. I mean, there's no question. And in my mind, you, in, in some ways, there's just no avoiding that. You've just kind of got to you know, keep on pushing through and wait and wait that out. Yes. I, I just don't think there's any other outcome. But I spent that time talking to absolutely anyone and everyone. I remember coming to see you in Adelaide. I would, uh, you know, at any, any opportunity I got to go to events around the country, I would always spend an extra couple of days speaking to the leading accounting firms in healthcare 
you know, speaking to the practice management system vendors who were kind of dotted around Brisbane and Melbourne and Sydney and yes. Adelaide. And, um, you know, I would just go out and talk to anyone who'd listen because I'd be really interested in, one, learning more and more about you know, the sector and how to solve their various problems, all yes. the different people who were in the industry and servicing it, but also to, you know, make it undeniably clear that I was here for the long haul yes. and, you know, Surgical Partners was here to help. And I can't, you know, really put into words how much that personal and brand capital and those relationships that were developed in those early years have just paid over and over and over. And, you know, I think in an industry like health, there's kind of no way around that. You've just got to sort of take that head on and, and um, you know, and wait it out. I think the challenge in healthcare entrepreneurialism is you just need very patient capital. You need people who are prepared to wait it out. It takes longer, yes. you know, to break down those uh, barriers to adoption. But, of course, the reward is once you get over those barriers and you've really solved real problems for people, then, you know, it's a very, very sticky customer base. Because, very satisfying. Uh, you've earned this trust and it, it's extremely satisfying. Yeah. Thanks, Marcus. Wonderful to talk to you. Great chat. I think, you know, you're so right about, I think as an entrepreneur, you saw 10 years ago where we should be and it can be very hard to be patient when you know Ooh. things can be so much better for so many people. So well done for persevering and, and your patience and it's all working out. Yeah, oh, look, it absolutely is. And, you know, you know, the payroll tax has been, you know, it's, it's been a bit of a gift and, and not so much a gift in an additional problem to solve necessarily, even though it is a, it is a bit that. But mm. you know, I think that, you know, when you're selling effectively a cost out or an efficiency solution, it, you know, I, I would argue it does generate more revenue for practices, but it, you're not really, it's not a more revenue sell, it's a cost out sell primarily. Mm. And they're always hard sells, but... What I really, I think, has been the gift of payroll tax is that for the first time, a lot of practices are looking at the back end of their mm. practice of their administration of financials and just going, oh, geez, that's not so good. Mm. You know, just the fact that they're looking and just Shone a light on it. Back, yeah, but it's just so bad when, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, they just wouldn't have looked why would it, Yeah, there. why would we spend the time or money in looking at it? Yeah, so... Thank you. We're going to keep the conversation going in our private Facebook group, You Legal for Doctors. You're welcome to join us there.